Tulas. Trima Tulas. Oh my god. How could they have thought it would be a good idea to drop these two series at the same time? Picard, just the second episode, but I can just kind of smell it in the air that we're gonna get bangers after bangers after bangers. This show is so good. This is some of the best content that Star Trek has made to date, and I think it is because of Terry. I think it's because of our good old boy, Terry Matalas! One of the new showrunners for the season of Picard is Terry Matalas. He's very white. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. He has been a dude who's worked on Star Trek in the past. He's worked on some of the shows from the 80s. He showed up as an extra in some of them, and he also worked in some of the newer shows like Enterprise. Whatever this guy's experience, whatever his relationship with Trek, whatever he's doing, I could just feel some sort of outside influence on the show, just making it good. Like there's an actual fan there influencing the writing, and I have just been getting so lit to this episode. So many feelings evoked, so many emotions are coming from the dialogue, the events, the references. Star Trek Picard episode 2 season 2 this one titled Penance we're just gonna get right into it because like I just want to talk about this stuff I'm so excited about what happened in this episode this episode started off with a very vague explanation from Q to Picard about what's basically gone on what I took away from Q's explanation is that Picard has done something wrong he's made a boo-boo he's the one who has broken time and I just think that he doesn't know it yet because this is going to be some kind of time paradox thing Thing that goes on towards the end of the season. I think Picard made the boo-boo aboard the Stargazer when he decided to give the self-destruct sequence action instead of actually just waiting to see what would happen. He gave in to fear. He gave in to the possibility of the Borg getting a hold of that entire fleet of ships and basically making a comeback. And instead, he decided to blow everything up. And I think that right there is our time paradox. That is what is basically messing up everything to the point where it has got Q concern. Q is like a totally powerful, omnipotent being, for the first time, he seems shooken up. Now, I saw some people on Reddit commenting about how Q's performance was un like and how, you know, there was a scene in this episode where he slaps Picard and Picard bleeds because he just gets fed up with old grumpy man Picard just kind of trying to pester him away like he always does. Q is actually shook. There is something wrong with the universe. There is something wrong with time to the point where it's got Q concerned enough where he's physically striking Picard and honestly Q is allowed to like murder people through his trials and games. He is kind of godlike. He can kind of get in trouble uh, to a degree for messing up with people but I feel like there's a set of rules that Q have. People are criticizing that and saying oh yeah it's not even three minutes into the episode and they've already ruined Q as a character. Anybody who says that, honestly, I'm just going to be mean to you right now, you lack critical thinking skills. The reason why that was put into the episode is to show the graveness of the situation, to show for the first time in a while Q is concerned for possibly something bigger than himself, something crazy is going on here. As a result of Picard's actions, it's just highly implied that this is all Picard's fault and that Q doing this and bringing them to this alternate timeline and also, it's not technically really an alternate timeline because it's their timeline. It's their timeline that's been like altered, right? It's their timeline, but it has been changed. They haven't been transported into another universe or an alternate timeline. I, at least that's my interpretation. Basically what it has happened is that now they have been transferred to this timeline where it's basically a mirror universe, but a little bit less explicit. Mirror universe, you have the Terrans and their whole evil organization. It's basically like that. It's called the Confederation. Picard is not the famous Captain Picard. Picard that we know him as. He's actually General Picard, the most ferocious slayer and conqueror all of the United Confederation. Picard has alien Xenos slaves in his villa. Not only that, but Q takes him into this room that's full of trophy skulls of different alien races, and it's so cool because General Martok's alternate timeline skull is in there. We also have Gull Dukat. The DS9 references, bro, in this episode. Oh my god. 
thank you, Terry Mata Las, for actually acting like Deep Space Nine is a real thing. I think it's my favorite Star Trek series. It's not my favorite Star Trek series to rewatch, but Deep Space Nine, pretty sure is my favorite Star Trek series. I'm geeking out over the Deep Space Nine references in this episode. They're so cool. After we get the rundown with Picard, we then need to go see what everybody else is doing because everybody else that was around the Stargazer vicinity and also those people that are just closer to Picard have retained their memories of the previous timeline and they're going to be used as assets to help old man Picard traverse this trial to see what that aspect of himself that he won't change, what is it? How are they going to repair this? What is Picard guilty for? I'm very interested to know. Basically, Seven of Nine is the president of the Confederation and she is married to the Magistrate and the Magistrate's pretty awesome because he's played by a very good actor and not only that, the Magistrate is very suspicious of everybody who's behaving like they're from an alternate timeline and that leads to a lot of really awesome interactions, especially with Agnes Gerardi. Agnes Gerardi is just a, you know, she's basically at the same position in Starfleet as she does in the other universe. Here she is a very well-respected scientist and they give her important jobs to do. One of those jobs that she has in this episode is taking care of the Borg Queen. We learn in this episode that there is an eradication day going on at the Palace of the Confederation. This happens once every year where they go and they eradicate and murder all the dissidents, all of the Xenos alien races that are trying to cause trouble in the Confederation. They just go ahead and pop a cap in their ass and murder them all. It's actually a very special eradication day because today they are ooh, getting the Borg Queen finally saying goodbye to the Borg, the final member of their whack ass collective. Agnes Gerardi in this episode, it's so great the interaction she has with the magistrate. She also has a virtual kitten AI program that she wakes up to in the alternate timeline that is voiced by Patton Oswald and Patton Oswald voicing anything just kind of makes it funny and personal. Dude has a really just funny voice. You know, he's the Ratatouille guy. Elnor has the most fun up alternate timeline start, I believe, because he just actually wakes up to 9-11 happening six or seven times in front of him. He is in Okinawa, Japan. It's very Blade Runner-y, and you just start seeing entire skyscrapers just boo, blowing up. And then his hot Romulan girlfriend, I assume in this timeline, they've got to have some kind of relationship, runs up to him and explains that, hey, you know, we're basically doing 9-11 right now to get back at the Confederation. And every one of those buildings that's blowing up is a planet that has been conquered by the Confederation. And as she's saying this, she's looking right into Elnor's eyes like she actually knows this Elnor. She's known him her whole life and it's finally happening, this climactic moment. <laughs> Warhammer 40k, baby. We're in the Warhammer 40k verse, and she just takes a giant blast to the back because we're in this context where it's an alternate timeline. We don't know this girl at all, and also Elnor himself is just kind of an unempathetic, cold-blooded killer. He does not even really bat an eye to that happening. He's very much concerned with himself and just runs away, and I think it's one of the funniest scenes I've seen. Not really meant to be funny, but it's kind of funny watching her just fucking get blasted. Then Rafi actually comes to Elnor's aid because Elnor is a Xenos species. He's a Romulan. That means everybody's going to be racist towards him. They're going to think that he's a terrorist. Rafi shows up out of the blue because she is head of security for the Confederation, at least on the palace and at planet Earth. And she's like, yo, I'm going to take this one in for questioning. Seven of Nine is recuperating. She is very much disorientated by the fact that she does not have her eye implant anymore. I don't know if she's still Borg or not. She said that she had like motor functions and everything. Is she still Borg on the inside? I know it was revealed in this episode that the version of Gold Ducat that Picard had slain in this timeline is actually the reason that Picard is in a synth body because, you know, Picard didn't get out of that one quite clean. But is Annika Hansen fully human in this timeline? Because, you know, she wouldn't really be able to get away being half Borg, being the president of the Confederation, in my opinion. So she decides to call up Rios because she learns that Rios is actually a colonel in the Confederation. Rios is on the front lines battling Vulcans with a whole like fleet of La Serena class ships. They are battling the Vulcans. He refers to it as Vulcan D-Day. It's very much reminiscent of what the Mirror Universe was like in Deep Space Nine, how they were constantly at war with each other. Rios is recalled back to Earth because now all the characters need to meet up with each other and they need to figure out what's going on and they need to team up. One thing that's great about this episode and one thing that's really great about season two Picard so far is that the team is melting 
holding so well. I love every character in the main Star Trek Picard cast. In season two, they're just behaving so awesomely. I love every one of them. In this episode, Agnes Gerardi, she didn't have the burdens of, you know, having Romulan brainwashing anymore. She doesn't think all organic life in the galaxy is going to end, so she can actually be very funny and personable, and it was really good to see. I, I like Agnes. I like Elnor. I like Rafi. Of course, I like Seven. And of course, I love Chris Rios. They're all great. They're all great characters. I love this cast. Chris Rios and Agnes Gerardi also kind of have an implied thing going on, and I think that might have been mentioned last season, but I don't remember. I have to go back and rewatch it. Seven of Nine is calling Chris Rios back to Earth. They reference uh, that there is a general fuck reference that there's a Cisco. There's a general Cisco in this timeline, and of course, whatever timeline, whatever alternate universe you put Cisco in, he's going to be like a general or a badass of some sort, and I just love that they even mentioned his name. Please, 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 while Avery Brooks is still alive, can we give that man a bag? Please, can we have him come back and do something? I love Deep Space Nine so much, and we've had a couple of the key cast members pass within the last five years, and it, it would just be so sad to see Avery Brooks pass away and leave us without doing any more stuff for Star Trek, especially because Kate Mulgrew is now back into the universe. After the Star Trek Picard crew then meets up and congregates back at the palace, they confer with the Borg Queen and basically learn that she can interpret and sense the changes in the timeline. She's very similar to an Elorian in that aspect that she can like see time differently from just regular mortal beings. She basically knows that something's wrong and after conferring with her, she reveals that there is a point in time, Los Angeles 2024, something very close to where we are in our timeline. Also, Star Trek, for some reason, whenever we go back to present Earth. They love going to Los Angeles. I love that two-parter in Voyager where Tuvok has the do-rag on. That episode was amazing and there was also 90s Elon Musk. <clears throat> Peak Voyager. That shit was great. So they learn they need to go back in time. They need to go repair something, but how are they going to do it? That's when Picard then references and suggests maybe we do the sun maneuver where we whip around the sun and create time travel essentially. And he mentions about how Kirk's Enterprise did it multiple times and then Agnes Gerardi was like, but they had, they had Spock. Who do we have? And then they turn around and they're like, oh, we'll just use the Borg Queen. But besides all that Borg Queen bullshit, that reference is insane. Are you kidding me? Picard was seen like reading files and dossiers about the original Enterprise on the next generation and at the time it was just cool to see it referenced. Picard being new to the Enterprise, he wasn't really geeking about Kirk at that point and then also at that point in Star Trek, they were not godifying the legacy characters just yet. It, we had to wait till we got around to Deep Space Nine and Voyager till they really start treating Kirk, McCoy, and Spock like actual gods. But that was just an insane reference. It actually made me want to cry. So basically what happens is they come up with this plan. Chris Rios is going to beam them out with the assistance of Agnes Dorati. They are going to steal the Borg Queen on Eradication Day when Picard is supposed to go and just, you know, pop a cap in her ass. Things get very dicey because Agnes is having a little bit of trouble, but she gets them out just in the nick of time. At the end of the episode, they plug in the Borg Queen. Stuff is starting to change. It looks really good. Everything in this episode looks really good. Also, I need to mention real quick, Elnor I just love that he is the one character in the show where it's totally okay for him to go all Michael Bay and every time he fights and murders people, it's so well choreographed and it just makes me want to jump out of my chair and punch somebody in the face like my masculinity is coming out of my body. There was this scene when he actually like slit somebody's throat with a combat shuriken. They were using the combat as shurikens in this episode. It was so sick. That was so hard. At the end of the episode though, after they plugged the board queen in and they think they're about to escape the federation and just kind of go off to los angeles the magistrate who's very suspicious of the alternate timeline people beams aboard with a couple of goons and then shoots elnor in the shoulder and why this is very worrisome is because they're in an alternate timeline where the federation is ultra evil and usually ultra evil factions in star trek have weapons that don't have a stun setting they're actually very lethal romulan and klingon weapons are historically extremely lethal and you very 
very rarely ever survive from them because they'll do crazy 40k shit like just keep make you keep on bleeding forever or they'll just turn you into dust. Elmer's life is very much hanging in the balance but of course he, he's a key character he can't die yet but it is a good bit of oh no this character could really potentially die because this is actually a really lethal situation but at that point the episode cuts off and I'm just sitting there alone with my thoughts and I'm just thinking holy crap that was an exquisite piece of Star Trek, and I cannot wait to see more. I cannot wait to see next week's episode of Star Trek Picard. I also have a really nice Star Trek meme that I'm saving for my next review, so look out for that. I recorded the new episode of Discovery, so if you want to go check that out, please do. This episode of Picard gets an 8 out of 10 for me. I was just excited, thrilled. I love the lore. I love the choreography. I love the writing. I love the character behavior. I loved all the events that happened. I don't think I had any criticisms. I just had great fun today. It was just another solid, great episode of Star Trek. Thank you, Teddy Matala! Anyways, with all that being said, I'm gonna go edit this and then I'm gonna go make some dinner. If you enjoyed the video, I'd be very flattered if you subscribe. I think I am 20 subscribers away from a thousand subscribers. That is very exciting. When I do get to a thousand subscribers, I am going to get a neck tattoo. So if you wanna see me potentially embarrass myself, be sure to hit that big red button. If you would like to discuss anything that we discuss here on the channel, be sure to join my Discord. The link is in the bottom of every video. Please leave a comment down below. I love comments, they're my favorite thing in the world. And with all that being said, live long and prosper. I'm gonna have to see you guys in the next one. Can I